Good evening. I'm Linda Wright Moore. Thank you for joining us for Generations of Struggle, a mother-daughter conversation about sexual violence and a discussion about No, the Rape documentary. First, a reminder. If you've not seen the 94-minute film, it will be available to view free of charge through this Friday, April 2nd. You'll find the link on the They Carried Us Facebook page. Tonight's discussion is brought to you by the authors of They Carried Us and Arch Street Press in collaboration with other sponsors, including Women in the Life Association, Gender Justice Fund, CCP Women's Outreach and Advocacy Center, Philadelphia Commission for Women, the Paul Robeson House, and the Colored Girls Museum. Our guests are all on screen with me. Um, they are Aisha Shahida Simmons, for whom the film has become a lifelong project as a filmmaker. Also here is Aisha's mother, Gwendolyn Zahara Simmons, who's featured in the film. She's a veteran civil rights activist and a professor emerita of African-American and Islamic studies at the University of Florida. Both of them are profiled in the anthology about the social impact of Philadelphia women leaders, They Carried Us. The co-authors of the book are also here, Asaha Trailer and Alina Baker Rogers. Welcome to everyone. I don't hear anything. Oh, we're thank there. you. You're there. Welcome, okay. welcome, welcome. Okay. Let's get started. Um, Aisha, um, in your profile in the book, They Carried Us, you state that in making the documentary, quote, I transformed my unspeakable trauma into my life's work. How did dealing creatively with issues of sexual violence in the black community enable you to transform yourself from a victim of incest and rape to a survivor and an activist? Uh -huh. Trailer and Alina Baker Rogers. Welcome to everyone. Sorry, Sarah. I don't hear anything. Oh, thank you. You're there. Okay. Uh -oh. Uh-oh. Okay. Let's get something... started. Um, I, I Aisha. It's um, playing back. Oh, yeah. I think it's playing back from a, um, another, from, if you have the Facebook video up, you could just mute the sound on it. Uh -oh. Please excuse me. I'm sorry. It's too much happening in the background. Um, first and foremost, thank you. It's really um, a, a, just a joy to be here um, with my mother and with Fasaha and Eleanor and Linda, so thank you. Um, so, you know, I when I first started working on No, when I first started No in 1994, um, working on it, it, I really, even though I am a survivor of sexual violence, of a childhood and adult sexual violence, I didn't think the film had, I thought I was doing it, I was like, I myself and Tamara Zabier, one of the co-producers, we were like, we want to help all those Black women out there. Like, that was the goal. Didn't think it had anything to do with me in, in a very surreal way. And, you know, at the end of that journey in 2006, and then also just even now, I'm like, wow, and making no really was pivotal in my own healing journey. So it's like this in this quest to support and help others, I in turn helped and saved myself. Um, so that was, that was huge. And, 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 and I think it was the, the, in working with no, or more making, making no over this period of 12 years, which was not the goal at all. Let me be, I thought I was going to be able to make it just like that. The whole process of making it was a very long journey, but it also really helped me to have compassion for myself because I was having compassion for other survivors and it helped me to really understand what it meant to be a survivor. So that as a, a woman, Audrey Iron says in the film, I may have been victimized, but I am a survivor. So let's talk about the, this chronological piece. Um, this story and film came <laughs> out of your experiences, imagination, your reporting, talking to others, but it started 25 years ago. You worked on it for about 12 years, 
seven of them full time. And it premiered in 2006 uh, at the Pan African Film Festival. And it's been seen around the world and continuously distributed since then. And what makes me curious about that is just like you said that um, you know you thought you would do the documentary and get it done in no time, but why did it take so long to complete and why is it still relevant after so many years? Yeah, um, it took so long because at that time people, funders, broadcasters were not interested in a film about sexual violence and healing and accountability um, with um, and non-carceral accountability, but they weren't interested in a documentary that looked at sexual violence of black women. The film moves from enslavement of African people in the United States and bypasses through key marker points in terms of, you know, around lynching and how Ida Wells Burnett was um, an aunt, profound and powerful anti-lynching crusader. And prior to that, really talking about Harriet Tubman, like just really looking at, at this chronology and the black power movements and all of that. And in, 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 in the film, black women are survivors, are, are also seen as experts. And it's all with the exception of the narrative vignettes, it's all, um, it's black women and men um, talking about how we're going to address this issue and, um, and I think, you know, it's hard right now in 2021 to kind of be like, well, why would that be a problem? And so in so many ways, given how many stories that we're seeing on, on network and cable television, I mean, it's incredible, right? But at the time when I was working on it, no one wanted to touch it. And then I was um, out as a, a, a survivor. I was young uh, <laughs> at that time. I was in my early twenties. I hadn't made a feature length film before. I only had shorts. Um, I'm a lesbian. So it, it was just all of these things that I think just kind of raised eyebrows. And I, I want to be clear that I don't think anyone is interested or was interested in talking about sexual violence. So those, those I, youth and uh, uh, survivor identity and queer identity, all those were kind of used as um, excuses not to support the film. So that's why it took 12 years. Mm -hmm. um, I studied with Tony K. Bambara in Philadelphia at Scribe Video Center. And she always used to say, it's the community that you want to name you. And I, I, I heard that as a young 20 something person. And now as almost 52, I really understand what that means because it was, it ended up becoming a grassroots international community project in terms of how it, it, it got made it was through contributions from people all across this, the United States and in various countries in Europe, um, really helping to make the film. And as a result, instead of being accountable to institutional funders, I was accountable to community and really decide, really was able to center the voices of black women survivors and amplify the scholarship and music and, and, and poetry of black folks who are talking about how we can disrupt and end this atrocity. So, with the, taking into account that you did have, in a sense, even though you struggled in terms of funding, um, you did have support uh, from the community that you were you were making this film for. What kinds of responses have you gotten? Can, are there things I know I'm talking? You've been getting responses for a long time, but in terms of sort of the global response, and I'm particularly curious about how the work was received in the black community, both then when it was initially released in 2006 and like now. Yeah, it, I think that no is in a unique situation because um, in many instances, you know, because no didn't have a mass mediated release. It wasn't on, you know, major network television or public broadcast so that the screenings were at film festivals, they were colleges and universities, at in prisons, at, at um, rape crisis centers. So many people who attended those screenings, they might necess not, not necessarily be like, you know, you know, on the front lines of anti-violence movements, but there was an interest, you know? Um, and, and so I share that to say, so as a result, 
I, I didn't receive the, the backlash that I expected, like for instance, that an Alice Walker received or an in, who, for the color purple or Intozaki Shange for, for colored girls. Like I really was expecting that. But I think because even no blue below um, a certain radar um, mm -hmm. that that played uh, played a role in kind of folks not knowing about its existence in a way for it to be like, let's have a conversation piece about that. With that shared, however, I've received, I mean, over overall, really positive was in affirming responses. I mean, that I've yet to have a screening um, here or internationally, and there have been instances many times internationally when myself and the people who are no were the only people of African descent and the only folks speaking English where folks were saying, this is my story. So, you know, in, in, in various being, if it's Roma Sinti folks in, in Eastern Europe or Algerian women in, in, in France, I mean, that, so you really just, I really just really grasp a deep understanding of the universality of rape. I've had screenings in black churches um, where I was present and then other black churches were using the work as a tool, an organization, Men Stopping Violence, which is a multiracial organization, but they also, they work in communities and it's, it's, it's used in, as a tool um, for their um, eradication of, of violence. Um, so there's been a lot of, um, a, a lot of uh, affirming response. I would say the hardest and harsh response was making it. Um, there, you know, that it was like a form of economic censorship where funder, I mean, I had networks say, you know, let's face it, most people in middle America don't care about the rape of black women and girls like that was, and you know, there, there are statements in literally documentation um, that I have been made public by major networks and, and, and programmers where they, they really use language that they would never use now. And that just speaks yeah. to, I think, the movement in the work that has happened where, you know, things that were quote unquote acceptable um, then were not now. So well, don't, don't yeah. give too much slack because, you know, everybody now stands with Black Lives Matter. And exactly. if you've been looking at your TV today and seen that trial, it'll remind you that not everybody is convinced yet that Black Lives Matter. Um, right. I'm always editorial wise. <laughs> No, speak the truth. <laughs> um, so here's, I want to fast forward. I want to move back uh, a, a generation here um, to, and this question goes to Zahara. Um, you were in the, you got involved with the civil rights movement when you were undergrad uh, at Spelman, became active in SNCC, uh, project coordinator for Freedom Summer in Mississippi, um, and continue to work for another 18 months. And that's really a fabulous experience, but um, you're featured in the film uh, talking about the position of women, including activist women in the 60s. Uh, on the one hand, you were supposed to be bold partners in leading, advancing the movement causes. On the other hand, you were supposed to be submissive to men in private and intimate context. So tell us about that contradiction. Well, thank you and uh, greetings to my uh, comrades on this uh, Zoom uh, webinar. Yes, it's, um, you know, the contradictions were glaring. Mm -hmm. um, I um, find that sometimes people don't like for us women uh, movement vets to talk about the reality uh, of that time when some of our male comrades uh, really did harass. And in my case, I was certainly sexually assaulted. Uh, and, you know, when I reported it, uh, I was told, you know, don't make a fuss of it. Uh, you should have given him some in the first place. So, you know, there was this idea that because, uh, you know, this guy is on the front line, now I'm on the front line too, mm -hmm. dodging the same bullets and, and being beaten in the head by the same cops and all of that. But nonetheless, after hours, you know, it's like uh, we need to be comfort women 
uh, to these men, uh, you know, which was just outrageous. And of course I was in SNCC, which was the most, uh, I would say egalitarian, mm -hmm. you know, of the civil rights organizations. We know that, you know, in the SCLC, in the NAACP, and to some extent also in core, you know, these were male run uh, and women were very much in the background. Uh, in SNCC, you know, we fought to be leaders and on the front line. And many of the men supported that. But at the same time, mm -hmm. we had this, uh, you know, sexism uh, and a certain kind of misogyny that most of these guys who are still with us today, like myself, don't want to admit. Yeah. But well, you know, I certainly remember from, I, I was coming of age at the same time and there was certainly that whole thing about, you know, how the women revolutionaries had duties and standing up and in another position as well. Yes. Um, and, you know, a lot of times I think young women, particularly young women, were kind of flummoxed by all this disrespect and sexist behavior among their male peers. But you, Zahara, um, uh, responded with a sexual harassment policy in 1964. Can you tell us about that? Yes, uh, you know, for Mississippi Freedom Summer, we had had uh, large gatherings, sometimes as many as 500 people in two different uh, orientation sessions. And it was at one of those orientation sessions that I was sexually assaulted by someone whom I looked up to uh, and I saw others. So when I was assigned to Laurel, Mississippi, uh, not initially to be the project director, but to be the head of the Freedom School and through something that none of us had foreseen, the project director was going to be sent to Parchment Prison for five years or signed that he would leave the state for five years. So then, uh, you know, the leadership of the organization said, we don't have anybody else to send. It really meant we don't have any men to send. Mm -hmm. uh, so you need to become the project director uh, interim and we will send somebody male to replace you. So I happen to be one of three women to be project directors. So now having had that experience myself and being, you know, I felt assaulted a second time when I was told, what am I complaining about? I should have given him some. I mean, I was so mad and outraged. And so when I became project director, I said, no men will be able to stay on this project who assault or harass movement women, women on the project, or any women in the community. And the, the men had to sign that. Well, over the uh, summer project, we had 23 uh, volunteers, most of them white young men, uh, some white women also. Uh, and so, you know, they didn't like it, but I said, well, you sign or you leave. Right, so right. they signed. And this uh, gets you a, um, a special, uh nickname, didn't it? Yes, it did. I was called the Amazon uh, and our project was the Amazon project. That uh, nickname really uh, uh, was applied to us after the summer when all of the uh, uh, volunteers had returned home except for two women. So there were three women, two white women and myself. And so we couldn't get initially any guys to come and work with us because they said, oh, we're not coming to that project. Those are Amazons. We're not signing any statement. <laughs> so two uh, later, because two high school young men were kicked out of their high schools in Hattiesburg and it was believed Hattiesburg was 30 miles south of Laurel and there was fear that they were in danger for their lives. So they sent them to Laurel uh, and, you know, they were high school uh, young men and they 
didn't care anything about it. And they were so glad to get out of Hattiesburg. Right. So our project went on with the five of us. So let's try to tie these two things together. Um, it's half century later, uh, we're in the era of, of Me Too and, and there's renewed emphasis with all sorts of examples always sur surfacing of no means no, no matter when you say it. Um, but are we still, has, has anything changed significantly? The issues, I mean, is it that the problem is, is smaller because people understand better? Um, or, or do things, is this a problem that will keep coming, coming back as long as people are people? Are you referring to me? Should oh. I speak to that? Or are you sure? Um, not, actually, or, either one of you can. Jump in. Well, let me, I'll just jump in to say, I think things are better, but obviously the, the, the problem is still with us and it's a worldwide problem. Uh, we, we uh, you know, as a professor of religion, um, I've focused quite a bit on uh, women and religion. And uh, of course, all over the world, we have this same problem. Uh, and, you know, the anthropologists, the feminist anthropologists uh, say that women have not been treated equally since hunter gatherer days. So, you know, we're talking millennia. Right. Uh, and, you know, religions, particularly the Abrahamic faiths have really uh, cemented uh, to a large extent, the misogyny against women and the feeling that men have the right, you know, to chastise women uh, physically, et cetera. So uh, I think we're in a period of change uh, in this country uh, and some of the other westernized countries, but still violence against women, sexual violence against women, it's rampant all over the world. Including so another issue, just piggybacking on that. And uh, I'm going to continue. Right, I'm going to uh, come to Aisha next. Is that during this period of, of pandemic quarantine, there's been um, yes. market increases uh, in um, uh, domestic violence. One yes. study came out and said it was like almost eight percent up. And there's other things I've read about shelters being full, etc. Yes, um, yes. So it clearly is still a problem. Um, yes. I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I definitely, I think what. So there's, for me, many ways that I, I'd, I'd want to look at it. So I think that, particularly because we're talking about, I mean, you know, sexual violence knows no boundary, and we're looking at, we're talking about as, as it relates to know the rape documentary, sexual violence in black communities. Um, so what I, I feel like what's, what has changed is that more, more black survivors are speaking up about what's happening. And, and because there's been historically this, and it's still there, a notion of we have to protect the race by all means, because we are under siege because of racism and white supremacy. So we cannot talk, air our dirty laundry. And now what I'm observing um, over the past 27 years is that it's kind of like, no, we're going to address racism and white supremacy, and we're also going to address sexual violence. Um, and I think just my, just the understanding that also, and particularly around childhood sexual abuse, and that sexual violence is, is, is ha happening, it doesn't know any boundaries, meaning that, you know, trans folks, boys, it, sexual violence is happening. And, and while men, cisgender men are definitely um, the big portion, proportion of, of, of the uh, people who cause harm, sexual harm, they're not the only ones who, who cause it. That's not what no, the rape documentary um, uh, explores. It really looks at the sexual violence committed against black women and girls by black men. But I also just in terms of my ongoing engagement and in just in terms of the, the, my continued work in terms of including the voices in, in, in my subsequent project, including the voices of survivors who are not necessarily uh, women um, talking about the violence that they experience as children. And focusing on that specific of sexual violence against 
black women as opposed to white women. Um, there's a divide there that persists, right? You mean- Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think, I think, I think that um, what, you know, what, what we see is, is that, I mean, we haven't, now we're seeing it, but for so long, black women weren't seen as, as, as capable of being raped. I mean, I, just to dovetail back to your initial uh, question around responses, I mean, I had young, I mean, and very earnest and, you know, not meaning to be offensive or anything as is often the case in the, when I was screening no in, in the early 2000s as a rough cut that people were saying white folks were like, well, prior to seeing your film, I didn't know black women could be raped. So that there was this kind of notion that I mean, I don't, I don't what know. it meant was that they thought it was either two, it was that we were so strong and that we were gonna fight them all. So it's like the, or that it was like all, all, always, you know, just sexual beings. So it was really, um, playing up on two huge stereotypes, right? That we're just unstoppable and we, you know, nobody's going to get in our way or we're always just available. And so, I mean, and I think that that played a role in why I didn't get, why it took so long to make the film because people just were not willing or able to see black women as both victims right? Because I show all of the survivors in terms of they share their testimonies, but then we see them again as agents for change, as experts. And we have, you know, Elaine Brown from the Black Panther Party, Janetta Cole, Beverly Guy Sheftall, you know, Loretta Ross, just really powerful women, scholars, activists um, who have really played pivotal roles in shaping. And of course, my mother, that goes without saying because she's on the call, but, you know, in terms of really shaping um, a lot of the way in which we think about gender violence and Black feminism, Barbara Smith. And so, and I think that that really, it was, it, I was pushing up against their um, funders' own notions and beliefs. They wanted to hold on to their stereotypes rather than let go and really see, like, we need to talk about this. And I want to be clear, like, it wasn't just white funders that I, black funders as well were like, well, a woman shouldn't be in a man's room at 2 a.m. in the morning. I mean, that was in a grant rejection letter that someone, you know, so it's just, oh, what's your ax to grind? It's like, I want to in rape. That's my ax to grind. Right. Um, and even when you look at the, the, um, the uh, Violence Against Women Act, uh, which has just been um, passed, but there were a lot of Republicans, 172 or something that voted against it. And this has been around, this law has been around since 94, first introduced in 1990 by Joe Biden. Um, but it didn't pass until after uh, the OJ Simpson, after Nicole Brown Simpson was murdered. Um, so it, it's like all the time there's, there, there seems to be the tug of war of people trying to do the right thing, but society saying, well, you know, no, that's nothing until something forces it, it into the forefront. Um, let's talk to our authors. And my first question for you is, how do you happen to select a mother-daughter team? I know they're both fabulous, but to select them to be in your book. And did you do that with any other family groupings? Well, let me, let me just say that um, there are a lot of families in They Carried Us. And, you know, I think that the Simmonses uh, are really an important family. So are the Fortens. So are Mamie Nichols' posse. Um, so, there are a lot of families in They Carried Us. And, you know, I think that it's something to be said for uh, the transmission of an activist bent uh, about a sort of critical view of society. Uh, and I, I think that this is not, the, the Simmonses are not the only ones in They Carried Us. Sissy, did you want to? Oh, yeah, I want you to I want you to dig a little bit deeper in that. There was a reason that though that you wanted the two of them in the book. Okay. I remember we were going through the selection, you know, you're like, you know, we we've gotta have, you know, these two women. So I just 
I don't know if you re remember all of that, but oh yeah, yeah, yeah you yeah. remember. You 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 thought it was really there was a very specific reason or reasons that you thought that the two of them should be. Um, yeah, well, that, that that is true. That is true, and I think that the, you know, I think one of the other things that we would want to say about that is that we think that the stories that each one of them told were very very important. You know, the the civil rights story you know, and the sexual violence story. That was very important. And we really thought that it was important for that to be vocalized, you know, for that to be presented, for that to be highlighted. Uh, we didn't want to shove that under the rug, so. Yeah, and to, uh, you know, I mean, I had the, I had the opportunity to, to interview you know, both of them for the book, Zahara and Aisha. And, you know, it was uh, for me. You know, being in that position, it was it was real obvious. It was immediately obvious why it was important for them to be in the book, for why their stories needed to be heard. Just you know, in terms of them as individuals, but also this this connection that is a part of this conversation that we're having right now. And you know, I, I would definitely say for me that uh, you know it was a learning experience listening to the both of them. You know, some things that. Um, yeah, you might have another question and I'm not sure about this, but you know, I wonder how many, how, how often it is that mothers and daughters get here, you know, to, to this place of, of, of realness. And I, and I imagine, well, I know, uh, you know, that, that it was hard, but the two of them got here. And uh, I just wonder how much that happens um, because I, I suspect it's, it's, it's desperately needed. Yeah, well, the, the mother-daughter relationships are among the most complex that yeah. there there are. So, um, and and having the the cross generational perspective on what is such an important issue um, is really meaningful. I am going to ask a question. We talked about we touched on this a little bit, but I want to have some fun um, when we were doing our prep work. So. In the montage at the beginning of your film, there are some clips with what, I guess, what do you call them? Gangster rappers and stuff. And <laughs> within those music videos where the girls were like almost not clothed and the guys, all, of course, they're always clothed. And you know where I'm going, Aisha, to the, oh, um, so to the Grammys. Um, I didn't see the Grammys. I was meditating, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> If you heard about it, you know. Um, no, so there, well, there were two very well-known um, performers. Um, um, okay. Megan oh, B. Megan Stallion uh -huh. and uh, Cardi B, who were, um, shall we say, dressed similarly to the women who were in the opening of the um, documentary with the in the rap video. Mm -hmm. with g-strings and rear ends poked up and all of that is that and and you know I happened to talk to a friend who was watching the Grammys with a uh, 10 or 11 year old daughter and sent her out of the room because of what she saw what perspective if any do you have about that kind of a display and what that says to the people who you said believe well that black people black women couldn't be raped and that they were sexual beings doesn't that just underline stereotype i i <laughs> well let me be very clear that my my um my having the videos in the montage in the opening of no it, there was it was an r kelly video it was a fat joe video so these are men who have uh their documented violence against uh, women. So that for me, it wasn't that that was really important to include the, the images of mm -hmm. the men. I um I really do not participate in any form of blaming or shaming um, women for the choices that they make about how they dress, about how how they earn a living, it, it, you know, um, about about their lyrics. I don't. I think for me, the work is on. Um, dismantling um, the violence that is committed. So 
we, you know, people could have said, oh, um, Trayvon Martin shouldn't have been wearing a hoodie. Um, there was a whole kind of question about attire or pull your pants up. And we don't, at, when it comes to kind of in that those response around race, we don't accept that, you know, usually particularly when people are being killed. So I don't really care if you're but naked. It. I don't care if you're a sex worker. I don't care if you have multiple sex partners. If on that last sex partner you said no and that person didn't uh, honor your, your saying no, it's not your fault. Um, there is an analogy of like, I could carry a lot of money in my purse. I could leave my laptop. I mean, you know, nobody's going anywhere because of COVID at Starbucks. I could like leave it. Let's say I forgot I left the laptop there, right there. And if somebody took it and, and I don't believe I'm an abolitionist, but if I called the police and we found, use my track, my iPhone or computer, they, I could press charges against them. So we could say, Aisha, you shouldn't have done that. How dare you leave your computer in the coffee shop or whatever you shouldn't. Have, and that, you know, that may be true, but we wouldn't be like, we would also say that person shouldn't have stolen, taken that. So right. I think that, and so I think in that kind of thing, it's, it's a very, um, dangerous, I believe, S slope when we get into, well, they shouldn't be dressing or doing or performing or all that because they're allowing the violence to happen when we know that sexual violence happens to babies, to elderly. And I don't think it's, be, you know, and, and as it relates to no, I don't, Cardi B, I think was she even, was two when I started working on no, and Megan was, wasn't even here. So, you know, it, it, you know, and then when I was, it could have been Lil' Kim. And at some point, you know, we, I've, uh, Alan and I had talked about the blues women. You look at some of those lyrics of Bessie Smith and Ma Rainey that there's mm -hmm. always some in my bowl, where, right? Where music. So mm -hmm. that's where I come. I don't, I really, if, if people don't want their children to see something on TV or listen to music, then I, I believe that the people who are in charge of the children, then, you know, at that time, then that's, that's important. And I hope that they would at least have a conversation about why they make that decision. But I really do not get it, go into blaming um, women for, or any survivor for the violence that they experience. Okay. I think you made your point very well. Um, <laughs> Because, and it basically is what I said earlier that no means no, no matter when no comes. Um, and, and therefore, um, you know, people have a right to project themselves as they want. Um, but I, it did cross my mind because the, the imagery of that just hits me in the face. No, um, and you're not the only person. So I don't want to be, I, I, I get these, the, you're, this is not like, oh, the first time I get this question, which is why I'm very clear, have a clear response to it. You know what I'm saying? Like, so I want to be that this comes up a lot. And I think it is, I think even if it's, uh, if, even if it's, I don't agree with or like, I think it's important that we have these conversations. I think it's much, I'd much rather put it out on the table so we can discuss it rather than people thinking it and not talking about it. So I'm glad, you know, I'm like, oh, you know, but I'm glad you asked the question so that I, you know, address it based on my experience in perspective. You know, I forgot to um, say, if anybody has questions, you can put them in the chat and we will, we will um, answer, the, answer you. Um, so here's um, my, I, I love this question. It's now, it, it was 25 years ago when you started this journey and it's now 21st century. If um, a lot of funders got together and gave you a big barrel of money um, to do no the rape documentary the sequel what would and you start from scratch what would you do what would be the story you would tell for this day and age mm. I would definitely include one of the things that I, I mean, I don't, you know, it's done and I did the best I could at that time, but no doesn't really touch childhood sexual abuse. Um, there's mention of it, but it doesn't touch it. And that's because, and you know, Alan referred to it in terms of how does it, how we got here, my mother and I, because I am a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. And that we, my mother and I have done a lot of, and my father offline have done um, a healing work around their 
bystanding roles to the abuse. Um, and so I share that to say that I would really include that. I would start there um, because I really firmly and unequivocally believe that childhood sexual violence is foundational to all forms of violence. I address this in my anthology, Love with, the Accountabil Love with Accountability, Digging Up the Roots of Child Sexual Abuse. But I really think that it, it would be really important. And I didn't touch it, A, because at the time I was working on No, I hadn't really dealt with what happened to me and I wasn't in a position, mental, psychological, to go there on screen. Um, but I really think that that is really key um, because I believe that um, we are taught to protect all of us, regardless of race, to protect the family at all costs. And so then as we get older, the family grows to we protect the church, to as we protect the community, to we protect celebrities that we don't know, but we feel an attachment to, to politicians. Mm -hmm. So there's, and to keep, we keep it in or we keep it silent. And so I think that there, there's something really um, deep connected to that. Um, so many survivors who've been abused as children, as I am one, have been uh, assaulted as uh, adults. I'm, I'm one of those folks. So I would really look look at that. I would include the um, voices of, of survivors who were not, um, who were trans, who were members of LGBTQ community. They're in no, as I'm, I'm one, so I'm not in no, but they're in no, but we don't, we're not talking about sexual violence. I'm not as a director in the, uh, the original, no, in the first no, talking, looking at all the ways in which sexual violence um, manifests itself. And I think I would really dig deep in terms of sexual violence in our radical, powerful movements for ending racialized violence. Because I think so often as my mother talks about in the film, it's kind of like, we don't have time for this. We have some, we, we've got this bigger issue. We got to deal with the Klan. We got to register people to vote in 1964. And as we know, what just happened last year, we had to register people to vote in 2020. <laughs> so, so there's this way in which we, the sexual violence is on the back burner. So for me, what I would want to do is like really look at how all the components and where and how sexual violence touches every component of our lives and why we have to address it, why we address all of the other forms societal ills. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit too about you one of the purposes of your film was to talk about um, accountability to um, uh, the to, to talk about how holding people accountable and that you used a word uh, non -car non carceral mm -hmm. accountability. What does that mean? Um, I really I I don't believe in in. Um, in prisons and, and policing. Um, um, so as in response to, to violence. And I know that and particularly when people hear that in the context of sexual violence, it's like, what? Well, what are we <laughs> gonna do? <laughs> Just gonna let the rapists run amongst us, you know? And, and the reality is, is, is first and foremost, it, I, we know as um, a, a study that the uh, transnational organization, Black Feminist, um, a Black Women's Blueprints was that 60% of black women are sexually assaulted by the time that they're 18. This is one of the reasons why I want to um, really focus on, on, on childhood. I would focus on childhood sexual abuse. And so, you know, I think that part of the silence and particularly we see what is happening in, uh, to black communities at, as a result of policing is people don't break the silence because it's like, they don't want to send another brother to jail. And, and so I really, and I really, tease this out in my anthology. I touch on it in no, because no one really is advocating for um, policing or prison, but we are advocating for accountability, um, for transformative and restorative justice. And so I, I, and I always, I believe that we have to think outside of the box. Right now, the only options that most of us are told, you've been harmed, you call the police, period. Um, the, and, but we know from RAIN, Rape, Abuse, Incest National Network, that out of every 100 rapes, about two people are committed, uh, are convicted. So that means 98 uh, rapes are not. And I, again, this is, and so, and, and there's so many people who experience harm and the harm doers are amongst us. So this is a notion that, oh, because if we don't have police, we're not gonna be safe. 
we're not safe. We're not safe because people aren't breaking silence. And so what would it look like if we had responses where the survivors are centered? So I want to be clear that it's not about um, um, sacrificing the survivors, but that there are also those who are working with those who commit the harm and hold them accountable in terms of uh, therapy, healing circles, all of that. So of course, this is not something that's going to happen overnight, but that is the work that I envision. It's not work that I come up with on my own. I, I'm in community with so many who are doing and thinking about this work. So that's mm -hmm. where I have a question um, about healing work in our communities. Um, what strategies should we encourage the community to heal from sexual violence? What, what steps can people take? Um, and I want to give an example, and it's, it's an old example, but I think it's really important. Many years ago, I was invited to um, Sixth Mount Zion Baptist Church in um, Richmond, Virginia. And they had a whole weekend. Um, at the time, the uh, late Reverend Dr. Katie Geneva Cannon um, was very much involved because she was um, a, a mentor a professor mentor to the pastor and to the assistant pastor, Reverend Dwileen Butler. And they had a whole weekend um, where they screened no. They had uh, Dr. Monica Coleman, who has a book called The Dina Project, which is a whole liturgy for survivors. Um, and, and for me, prior to that, I was like, this is, this is where we need to be, right? Because it was, it, that, that entire weekend was packed it was, and there was um, free childcare, there were free workshops, there were conversations centered around ending sexual violence. The, uh, the preacher, pastor, um, well, Dr. Cannon spoke, gave the, the, the um, sermon, but he had all of us speak. And I'm not Christian. I wasn't raised Christian and I'm not Christian. I'm an out lesbian. And he had, so I just say that he brought us all into that pulpit, myself, Dr. Cannon and Dr. Coleman, to talk about sexual violence and said, we are going to deal with this issue. We are not going to sweep it under the rug. Was and, it with his whole congregation, like men and women? Yes, this was men and women. It was, and it was mm -hmm. profound. I mean, I could see in terms of the, the parishioners being so moved to be affirmed mm -hmm by their pastor. Cause see, that's, that's, that's the work. So when we talk about that healing work, we need the pastors, we need the imams. We, I mean, we need everybody. We need the teachers the social workers. And so, but when we're talking about community cause that's where people are going on Sundays or on Fridays, if they're going to Juma, you know, like, so that's the work that I think when we're talking about healing that it's not solely, I mean, cause churches are on it in mosques too around racial violence and Islamophobia. We have to have that same response and reaction when it comes to sexual violence. Yeah. yeah. Everybody agrees. Kasaha, um, yeah. I wanted, what do you guys think about it? There's some other perspectives here of looking at this whole issue um, from the authors of, of what you take from the documentary and um, the discussion that we've had? Well, if, if I can, there are a couple of things that I'm thinking. Number one, I'm thinking that so much of this is rooted in the idea that, um, that force is okay. Uh, you know, which is, you know, force I would describe as just, you know, a little bit away from violence, but the idea of force being okay and, and that being something that uh, people think is really you know, important to, to, to be able to force someone. Um, and I also think that, you know, that a lot of this is rooted in our failure really to take the lives of women seriously. I mean, why, why should a woman's life be any less important than a man's life? You know, why should, you know, why should we not be really, you know, we should be 
focused on making sure that all the members of our community have, you know, are able to live out their lives in dignity. And I just think that that's, um, that I just think that that's really important. And I guess maybe the third thing that I would say is the idea that women have to take responsibility for the actions of men. I think that idea is old. We need to throw that to the trash heap. Okay, <laughs> we really need to throw and that burn to it. the trash heap. Yeah. Um, yeah, because mm -hmm. you know you you can only control yourself. Mm -hmm. Never mind what somebody else is thinking about you or whatever. So I I just hope that we can move toward that. You That's know, probably not different from what Aisha or Zohara it's has said. Not, and it and it really is so basic. It 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 is the same. It parallels the kind of respect uh, and equal equity that that the movement was about yeah for mm. african americans yeah. yeah let me just say there's a a, a book title uh, actually that i should teach from um and uh by uh sarah lawrence lightfoot and it has nothing to do with this topic at all but the the title is uh, essential conversations and one of the things that I take from the film and uh, the documentary and this discussion is that, you know, I would, is, is that young girls, there needs to be a way for us to have these conversations with them. You know, we talk about this notion of good touch, bad touch. I don't know how much we really get into that with them. So that's one of the things, just listening to, you know, the woman who was 12 years old uh, you know, in the documentary. And I think there was someone else who was, who was younger too. Um, you know, that, you know, one of the things that has happened, and this is another thing I think needs to be thrown out to some extent, uh, you know, in the black community is that, you know, if, if um, an if adult tells you to do something, you do it. Mm -hmm. Well, well, what if it's not good for you? What if it is sexual assault or rape? And, and how does a, a young girl, preteen, teenager, you know, know how to grapple with that in her head as that 12 year old, as the woman who was a 12 year old said, she didn't even know what sex was, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? So that's one of the yes, things. They don't have words for what they don't have words for happened. It. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't even have words for their, their body or their body parts, <laughs> you know? So I take that from it and, uh, Aisha can't say it enough, uh, and I certainly take this from it. Accountability, accountability, accountability. Uh, and, and a notion, and, and, and this, this thing about secrets, um, you know, we got to throw that in the trash dump. Yeah. So yeah. those are the kind of things that I take from this. Okay. Um, any closing thoughts? Zahara, Aisha? Mom, you haven't said anything for a while. Well, I mean, <laughs> you were carrying the ball there beautifully. Uh, you know, again, uh, even though uh, I just read where only about 60% of the people in America say they are uh, churched or mosque or synagogue. So we know that religion is playing uh, less of a role than it played for instance, when I was growing up. But nonetheless, uh, I also think that we have to deal uh, with scripture uh, yeah. and interpretation of scripture uh, that has been used to justify male control of women's lives. And this is not only in the Abrahamic faiths, uh, this is in, you know, Hinduism, Buddhism. I mean, all of the religions almost that I know of uh, have put women beneath men and men having control over them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that we have to absolutely deal with that. And we need to, in our schools at the earliest ages, teach our boys and girls uh, that uh, the two are equal, 
uh, respect for one another and all of that. So I think we have a lot of work to do yeah. to change this uh, cultural underpinning mm. of violence against women. Thank you. There's a comment here too, Linda. I, I saw that. Yeah, I'm, I'm having a, What is it? I'm uh, having an eyeglass issue. It's here. Not too, it says not too many questions because the movie in this panel have covered everything. Thank you. That's very nice. Thank you. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, nice yeah. to hear you. You know, one final thought I had, and I, I meant to mention earlier, is that in watching the film, the, the overarching thing I came away from it with is that I don't believe this is 25 years old. There was something so mm -hmm. elemental right. and timeless mm -hmm. in, in the presentation that, you know, because a lot of times if you shot some of it, you know, even five years ago, 10 years ago, mm -hmm. it looks dated or so, somehow, but right what was being conveyed, communicated, and the way it looked and the way it felt, felt very contemporary. So um, if you, Aisha, if you don't happen to make a sequel, um, I think the work will, will stand, stay in the yeah, test. It feels, um, it feels um, it, I'm, it, I'm sad that it's timeless, you know, because it speaks to Absolutely. where we are. And, but really, I, I, I really, as, we live in this really fast paced social media age where it's like you create, you create content immediately. And I am so not thankful that it was hard and that I had single digits in my checking account for a big part of the time. Like, I'm not happy about that. But that long process um, resulted in an exponentially better film than had I got that money right away. My vision grew because of engagement and learning and listening. Um, um, to so many people, the community that I was accountable to and for at, at, at that time. So that is- um, And that was real that's obvious. Amazing. That's very obvious from watching yes. the documentary. And again, you know, it's gonna be available. It is available for the folks to view until this coming Friday or through this coming Friday too? Or yeah, through. it's available for free for, um, if you go to they, the They Carried Us Facebook page um they had they had there's the password because i don't know the 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 url because it's a vimeo um, url and then after the second um no is available for a one dollar streaming rental for 70 72 hours i drastically lowered the price um in response to COVID. i wanted it to be accessible mm -hmm. um to all and it, it is subtitled in spanish french portuguese and german and all of that that translation were done was done by black women whose mother tongue they, they speak those languages it's very important for me for the film to be accessible in the at black diaspora and so that was um something so if you don't see it um before by friday you can go to know the rape documentary dot org and that's no n o because sometimes people spell it k n o w so it's n o the rape documentary dot org and go to the streaming page and it will just you know connect you to the to the Vimeo page and you can um, view the film there for one dollar streaming rental. Okay, um, well we are uh, we're our time is just about up so um, I really enjoyed this discussion. Aisha Zahara, Basaha, and Alina. Um, we want to thank all of you for joining us on this last day of Women's History Month. Um, thanks also to Christopher Rogers of the Paul Robeson House for providing our technical support. Yay! And again, you can see the documentary through this coming Friday for free and for $1 thereafter. Um, I encourage you, by the way, if you didn't see it, to please look at it and also to get a copy of They Carried Us. And so you can read more about our guest and dozens of other fascinating women from Philadelphia's past and present. Thanks again for being with us and good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Wonderful.